is there any special trimester that is more risky than another? Okay, so, so talking about the first trimester, of course, the risk uh, of miscarriage is much higher. So I mean, we must remember about that. So the risk is uh, like, you know, 10% that a woman can lose the pregnancy. Welcome back to the to another episode of the Next Gen PT with the PDBA. And I have the wonderful, the amazing Dr. Anna Shumilovich with me. Uh, she is a regular professor in Poland, in Gdansk. But you know what, Anna, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Alish. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about pregnancy and postpartum exercise. And as Alish mentioned, uh, I am an associate professor at Gdańsk University of Physical Education and Sport in Poland, but uh, we have a huge collaboration all over the world. Um, so I have a pleasure and honor to work with people from Africa, from North America, from around Europe and from Asia. And it's a really huge collaboration and we would like to spread the knowledge, uh, we would like to spread the evidence base that we collected together. And we would like to educate exercise professionals how to plan and how to implement exercise programs for pregnant and postpartum populations. So uh, my main work is <laughs> to translate science into practical guidelines and exercise professionals is one of our targets. And of course, we would like to educate um, pregnant individuals, pregnant um, women, because it depends what country we are in, because some countries use the term women sometimes are a little bit afraid of using the term and we use individuals. So it depends where we are. So okay. it doesn't really matter where we are, but of course, pregnant people are our target. So we would like to provide them with a good service in terms of exercise and physical activity programs. So this is my main goal. <laughs> and I would like to share some tips for you during this short podcast today. Okay, I see. So here, here's here's my take on it. Uh, before we even move further, for me, only females can be pregnant. So I'm I'm really comfortable using the term women yes. i'm old school uh so I'm, I'm i'm really sorry to mention it but i just don't buy in that because you know it's where where I'm from how i've been raised and so on and so on so it's it's for me that's okay um anna so you try to educate people on this topics especially about pregnancy combined with training physical physical endeavor and how to do it better and more right but there are so many misconceptions right now on the market what is okay what isn't okay how it should be how we can do it differently or there are especially influencers out there you know claiming claiming all sorts of stuff how do you as a professional in that field not only as a professional because you've been a trainer for yourself um for how many years many years right better not to say Alice <laughs> not, not to say but I can say it's more than two decades so it's enough okay. right so you don't ask women how old you are so I started early and I've been uh, in the market for a long time so I have some experience being a trainer and instructor and it's a uh, really uh, very very nice experience to work with pregnant and postpartum women so um, of course uh, you said about the uh, influencers. So I hate influencers, especially if they don't read uh, evidence-based papers. Of course, we need them sometimes to promote uh, some approach, but uh, yeah. this is my request to them before you do anything, before you say anything <laughs> as influencers. So please read what is currently um, updated, the guidelines, the papers, the recommendations, because sometimes we can see that uh, there's a lot of myths around physical activity during pregnancy and postpartum. And sometimes the myths are very harmful for women. So especially those myths related to the limitation of exercise, limitation yeah. of intensity, sometimes, you know, trying to put a woman to the bed for the whole pregnancy. So these are very harmful myths. And we are trying to fight against this myth 
especially um, using the evidence-based knowledge. So you mentioned some uh, some something related to specific exercises. What I can say, it always depends what kind of client you have, and uh, each pregnancy is individual. So we have to have individual approach. But for sure, we don't have the list of what we sh shouldn't do. Okay, so we don't mm. have don't do that list. <laughs> Uh, and it always depends. It always depends on the uh, exercise capacity of the technical abilities of a client. And we always have to take into, the, uh, into account the course of pregnancy, the health status, and of course, the uh, skills. First of all, the skills uh, and comfort of, of a woman. So these are my tips, first of all. <laughs> I see. Uh, first of all, yeah, I hate that influencer bunch as well. Not, not you know, per se, but the things that, that we can hear and see on the market is just horrendous at times, what, what they put out. And the problem that I see, and that's that's one of the reasons why we invited you, uh, you know, in our schools and in our fields or in our markets to teach so many times was because I really am looking forward to make things better and to provide a knowledge that is evidence-based, science-based, and, you know, practically applicable. Because that was one of the main reasons for me that, that we've reached out to you, especially. The problem that we have in the education field today is that many influencers that are, you know, just selling those myths all across the board are today organizing seminars to teach women how to act, how to train, or better just how to not train, because that's their selling model. And they're just pushing out so many more myths. I mean, there were some crazy things that I've heard in, in the past five, six years when I paid a bit more attention, thanks to you, to what's going on. So, for example, how if we would break it down as soon as you get pregnant, so what, uh, what would be okay or what would not be okay to do in the first trimester? Or is it maybe another question before that? Is there any special trimester that is more risky than another? Okay, so so talking about the first trimester, of course, the risk uh, of miscarriage is much higher. So I mean, we must remember about that. So the risk is uh, like you know ten percent that a woman can lose the pregnancy, but it is natural abortion, and we actually cannot do anything about that in terms of our lifestyle and in terms of um, exercise, especially. So, of course, this woman should avoid stress, should lead healthy lifestyle, but exercising actually cannot do anything about that. So, I would like to say that exercise will support the pregnancy, <laughs> but actually it's not the moment for that. So, the better moment to use exercise for supporting the development of pregnancy would be the period before pregnancy to support yeah. the body to be prepared uh, to, to, to support the development of pregnancy, right? So, it would be better. But when a woman got, uh, got pregnant, so... Uh, it's time to relax and also to do what she likes to do. And if she was not active, she for sure should start exercising at least in line with the current recommendation. So it should be around 150 minutes of at least moderate intensity exercise. So it should be uh, at least like that. But if she was much more active before, so she should continue it as long as she feels comfortable with the exercises. So if she was jogging before pregnancy, she should continue. If she was cycling, it's okay to cycle still. And um, if it was a little bit maybe more dangerous uh, kind of sport, so it is always good to consider the risks of harms, of injuries, because mm. uh, it's not a problem to, uh, you know, so usually the form of exercise is not dangerous for the fetus and for the pregnancy development, but the injuries can be problematic um, because you cannot use some treatments, you cannot use some drugs, even the painkillers during mm. the first trimester and even you know later during pregnancy. So it's better not to harm yourself. So some technically complicated forms of exercise should be reconsidered because sometimes what we see uh, that a woman is continuing some gymnastics or you know very difficult uh, skating or uh, 
you know, rollerblading. Uh, yes, so she yeah. must consider it. So it's not that it's forbidden, but she must consider if she still feel okay with this exercise. Okay, because if she was doing it um, every day, so she can continue it. She probably feel still com feel still comfortable during this exercise, but it's always very very individually assessed. So, so. basically, what what we say is that exercise on its own has very little impact on the fetus in the first trimester. And for example, combat sports are always, you know, on the on the on the rise or um, in the first means where we say, yeah, well, you better should not do that. What if we can, you know, just change the combat sport? So you would probably not go into sparring, but you can still go and train for kickboxing, like punches, kicking and so on. But you you're not in the direct combat. For cycling, for example, it would be would it be advisable not to cycle outdoors, but you just transition into indoor cycling because it's less probable that you fall down, you know? It's of course, so the transition from, uh, you know, uh, regular cycling to indoor cycling is okay, but I would not recommend even though, even this, okay? Because still, if you are uh, in natural environment, you feel much better and you have more oxygen for your body, not being uh, indoor. So uh, if you have good environment for that i would recommend continuing if it, uh, some scandinavian countries have the recommendation to continue active transportation using cycling so it is official mm -hmm. recommendation for pregnant yeah. um, uh, women uh so i would not be worried about that so maybe i would reconsider you know being uh, very high in the mountains using bicycle and you know being an <laughs> athlete yeah, uh, yeah. so it's of course always difficult uh, but, um, uh, you know, using uh, bicycles just for active transportation to feel comfortable in the nature, it's a perfect form of physical activity. And I, I would not be worried that something can happen. Of course, traffic accidents are dangerous. So maybe not crowded streets, uh, maybe not, uh, you know, not prepared surface for cycling it's it's risky but not everything and coming back to the combat sports yes you said that we can maybe avoid sparring um, element of of this uh, yeah. kind of physical activity but of course all the technical exercises can be continued even with higher intensity but coming back back to the uh, sentence that you said about that we cannot influence uh the fetus uh, to exercise yeah. so during the first trimester it is true that the mother is not um, uh, directly connected to the fetus because the placenta is developing but some connection is and we must remember yeah. about that and first of all through exercise we can uh support what's going on in the mother's body body so mm. so it's not that positively. We, positively positively yes of course so we have for example the problem uh, problems with metabolism so the risk of gestational diabetes the risk of hypertension uh changing the uh, lipid metabolism so everything is influenced by exercise so even if in the first trimester, we cannot directly support the fetus. So through the mother body, through her better uh, functioning, we can support the fetus later in the second mm -hmm. trimester, in the third trimester, preparing the placenta development and you know supporting the baby with better nutrients later uh, uh, when the pregnancy is progressing. So you know it's um, it's not so easy to say that no impact, but. Yeah. And we don't have much evidence that actually it works, right? So I would say something like that. But first of all, it's not related to the higher risk of miscarriage because I that, want that, to that, that was my point. That, <laughs> okay. that was my point, what I've tried to yes, say. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, yeah. so a woman should not be afraid that you know her being physically active, she will increase the risk of miscarriage. It's not mm. true for sure. We have the data from around 53,000 of pregnant women. And it was a huge uh, systematic review by Professor Margie Davenport and her uh, research team from Canada. And we have evidence that there is no high risk of miscarriage or any other problems related to fetus, fetus health uh, when a woman is active. So, of course, there are some concerns related to higher intensities because we don't have data on that. So we cannot say 
it's risky, but we should say we actually don't know. So you must observe your body. You must be monitored maybe a little bit more often if you exceed the guidelines. So the guidelines are clear that we know that moderate to high intensity is okay, but exceeding the uh, level, like uh, we use the Borg scale from zero to 10 and it will be around eight or nine, or when yeah. we use the board scale from six to 20 and it will be like 17, 18 or higher. So you must be uh, monitored uh, maybe a little bit more often to check if the baby is not, um, uh, you know, so so that the progression of it is, is not disturbed through exercise. It, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Because usually unless you, you're doing any kind of a pregnancy test and your hormonal changes already started to kick in usually most of my clients in in the past 24 years when i was a trainer or am still a trainer didn't know that they were pregnant until week five or six so when when they notice oh okay, okay something's happening to my period i don't have it anymore so now i'm going to do a pregnancy test so it just does you know add up to that it makes a lot of sense that you don't have to be too afraid to, to exercise or do any kind of training in the first trimester. But what happens in the second then? So what would be the difference between the second trimester and the first? Okay, so first of all, during the second trimester, the mother feels much safer because of the you know placenta development. So the baby is well supported by the mother already. The placenta should be properly developed. And um, she feels much better, so the first symptoms of pregnancy, which sometimes can be not very pleasant for her, like feeling tired or you know headaches or you know what she she sometimes doesn't know what's going on with the body. So uh, during the second trimester, she doesn't feel feel so often these discomforts, and she usually has uh, more energy, uh, and the exercise is much more pleasant. The belly is not so big as in the third trimester, so many exercises are still comfortable and easy to be performed. And uh, so, so the general recommendation is to continue what she was doing during the third trimester if she was active. And of course, if she was not active, so she should start again at least the 150 minutes of moderate to um, high intensity exercise. And uh, again, it can be everything she feels okay in, all right? So um, walking sometimes is the most recommended form of physical activity. But from my perspective, <laughs> walking is not good for the back. Um, it can be okay for the back, but uh, it must be... So, so, so walking is not easy. <laughs> when a mother has a big belly and she doesn't keep proper posture and the gait, the gait pattern is changed. So sometimes mm -hmm. after a long walk, she can feel more severe back pain. And mm -hmm. uh, I th therefore I recommend uh, marching instead of walking. So being more activated, the full body is activated. We have proper line of the body, of the spine. And first of all, the uh, abdominal muscles are activated. But jogging is the best <laughs> version of you know this kind of uh, activity so a little bit marching jogging marching jogging so it activates the body to proper posture so uh, in terms of jogging or running uh, the only concern is the, the urinary incontinence that can mm. be um, more severe during high impact activities so sometimes if a woman feels that there are some symptoms of pelvic floor muscle disorders. So it's better to go to a specific physiotherapist uh, who is specialized in pelvic floor muscle problems. And we can assess if she needs maybe some uh, more intensive support like biofeedback or some kind of physiotherapy to support pelvic floor muscles. But of course, the general, general, general recommendation for all women it doesn't matter what age. Uh, it's pelvic floor muscle training uh, on a regular basis, but during pregnancy and postpartum, it is must have, must to be done. And without that, uh, I cannot imagine any training. So it should be a, an element of every single session. 
and even between the exercise sessions, just watching TV or doing something, sitting or standing or walking, she should have some short activities, some short contractions of pelvic muscles, and uh, it should be done like we have so-called quick flicks, so contract and relax pelvic muscles, and then we can have a little bit longer, like contract and keep the contraction for 10 seconds, you can mm -hmm. extend the time for 20, 30 or 60 seconds of um, contraction. And very important thing also to practice relaxation because we need relaxation to release the pain, to release the uh, uh, hypoactivity, hyperactivity of pelvic floor muscles. So when the muscles are very, very much contracted and sometimes can be painful so we need relaxation and also it's important as an exercise to prepare for birth natural birth using the pelvic muscles and to relax pelvic muscles to support the proper um you know going the baby through the birth canal uh, to the world <laughs> yeah. i see well, we're talking what is it just kegel exercises that are well known or is is there something more do we have anything you know where could we lead our clients for example or, or if there's a link where i could just you know lead our listeners to where to get where to get more info about this about these exercises you mean the pelvic floor muscle exercises yeah yeah that i can do so uh so during our seminars we have a special part uh, how to teach women to contract pelvic muscle because this is the problem usually that they can read nowadays actually everywhere so all the portals websites booklets and and you know promotional materials have this information that they should exercise pelvic muscles but Sometimes they say, okay, I know that I should exercise, but I don't know if I'm doing it correctly or it will be effective or not. So the first important thing is to teach them how to contract and relax. So for exercise professionals, it should be important to know what instructions they should give to a woman, to the client. And of course, to support them to do it on a regular basis. So we have a lot of programs, different programs, different modes of pelvic floor muscle training. And again, we cannot say which one is the most effective. We mm. have a wonderful program from Professor Karibu from Norway, which is very popular, but we have also other programs that we can observe different combinations of contractions, relaxation. Uh, personally, I use the program from uh, Professor Janet Miller from University of Michigan, which I like a lot, but it's because I like it, so I use it, but okay. I don't claim it's the most effective ever. Um, but we have a um, nice observation that it works in different populations, both pregnancy, postpartum, postmenopausal women, and also we started to do this program even in young men, so male population is also our target today to teach especially very active male athletes especially like uh, we have you know um, lifting uh, working hard in the gyms so even them healthy young male participants can experience urinary incontinence so we should exercise pelvic floor muscles as the whole population but teaching people is very important and instructors coaches, trainers should know how to do that and support to keep the motivation and the clients to do it throughout the life. So and this is this this is exactly what you do in your educational seminars and this is why why uh people are taking them as well, you know, to understand how yeah, to so, teach so, so during the seminars first we teach I teach how to to teach <laughs> the client to do the exercise. Uh, what are the methods that um, the client can check, self-assess the ability uh, if she's contracting it properly at home? And second, uh, I try to give uh, the set of exercises they can easily use um, for a few weeks um, with the client 
during pregnancy and postpartum. So as I said, it's based on the training developed by uh, Professor Jenny Sinile. And it worked perfectly. It's easy to be implemented, not only for the perinatal period, but for all clients. I see. Okay, so that would be now a bit of coverage for the second trimester. So incontinence problem uh, might arise or are, are higher then we see it definitely in, in the first trimester. So what then, what comes in the last part? What comes, what, what, what do we have to be aware of in the last three months? Uh, yeah, if we are, we should be worried. I don't know though. <laughs> I must say that the mother, the future mother is always worried about everything. Okay, mm. so she shouldn't be worried usually, but it's a very typical uh, situation that she's worried about if the baby is healthy or if she's uh, good prepared for the birth, if everything is will be okay during the birth and later after giving birth and many other things related to professional work, to the uh, relationship, personal relationship with the partner. So many things. So it's a very common situation that the mother feels depressed and she feels a lot of anxiety related to the childbirth and generally to the changing of the social role. And we must be um, aware of that and support them uh, when we observe some symptoms of depression because uh, it is it is really a very common disorder for pregnancy and postpartum period. What we know that um, through physical activity, we can decrease uh, the risk of having uh, prenatal depression by about 40%. So it's a huge number. So if we observe a woman who is losing motivation to exercise, we should continue talking to her and you now give them some uh, tips that the woman should continue exercising because it helps for their mood, for their body. So this is one thing that we should be aware of, of um, psychological uh, aspects of working out with the pregnant client. But there are more concerns related to back pain, to pelvic muscle disorders. So if any symptoms of urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, um, appeared in the first in the second trimester, so probably it will be more severe during the third trimester. The belly is big and heavy, so we must remember that all exercises with our uh, with the, the weight of body will be more demanding for a woman. So sometimes we have to adjust the load. So if we had, for example, twenty repetitions of squats. So maybe it will be enough to do 10 or 15 because when we add extra kilograms, mm -hmm. so our legs can feel it you know, in the same way. And we must oh. explain the woman that she actually is not losing her performance, the, you know, uh, the strength of the legs, but that the load is higher and it's very typical that sometimes we have to decrease the load of the of the uh, exercise because the load of the body is much higher so um some tips uh, we should be aware that breathing is a little bit more disturbed through the baby the baby is higher in the belly so using the lungs uh, and using the diaphragm is a little bit just biomechanically disturbed so we have to teach them properly breathe not being aware that they sometimes lose the breathing. So it's typical reaction of the body during pregnancy. Uh, and having a lot of breathing exercises, birth preparation exercises is um, key importance, of key importance. Okay, so um, exercise professionals should not forget that the third trimester is not only keeping fit, but also the preparation for birth. So birth positions, relaxation exercises, breathing exercises should be implemented in the exercise programs. Good. And you probably remember the nice sessions related to birth positions. It is always oh, yeah. a fun, especially <laughs> for male instructors and coaches that we you know do squatting birth position or you know kneeling birth position. But it's very important to teach women how to use birth position because we want to support them to be prepared for natural birth and these vertical positions 
can be um, very beneficial for both the mother and the baby. And we know that it can uh, decrease the level of pain, uh, that the blood flow is much supported in this position. It's not disturbed like in the supine classical mm. version of giving birth. The reason why I'm laughing is because I, I still have the picture in my mind when you know all the all the male trainers on our courses were doing that and laughing you know because it, it it was so unusual for them but it's very important i agree you know and i've done that thanks to you again with um with quite quite some of my clients when they were pregnant it helped so that's that's a good thing okay yeah, good now <laughs> no, yeah but no. I will also add something about you know the birth position because uh, some women know that they will not use um, that they will not have the natural birth because of some mm. you know, contraindications. Uh, there are some, and around 10, 15 women should have cesarean section at the end of pregnancy. But uh, even though the birth positions are important because they are perfect position to relax the body and to stretch the parts of the body that are very a tense uh, during pregnancy so mm -hmm. it's it's also a, um you know a strategy to prepare the whole body uh to the end of pregnancy so basically what a trainer should do is get if we have a client that is just that, that just got pregnant it's our job as a trainer to take care of their well-being as through physical exercise or physical activity which is good that that's our concern and also prepare them for for birth yes yes and it's not so difficult because when uh sometimes i uh, talk to instructors trainers so they are a little bit afraid of this part and of mm. course we have special schools birth schools uh, i know that in many european countries it is a compulsory element of birth preparation and um the partner and the pregnant woman they are taught about the birth position breathing exercises but it's only a few classes a few sessions so it's not enough we should do it as any exercise if we would like to see uh the effects okay mm. so if we would like to see a nice abdominal muscle so we don't exercise once or twice <laughs> during you know six months but we do it regularly uh, every you know twice a week, three times a week, and then we can expect some effects. And the same is with birth position. So the body must to adjust, uh, we must be stretched properly. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it is also some kind of psychological preparation because the birth position can, uh, as you remember, uh, you can feel strange, you can feel strange, mm -hmm. but you should not feel strange being a woman during labor when even if you, if you are at the hospital, so this position should be natural for you, not feeling uncomfortable because it's not usual position that you are using um, during every lifestyle and everyday, you know, activities. So just included in the regular program design, and that should do it um, on a regular basis. So it should be a part of the training program as any other exercise. Why do you think? are still so many trainers afraid to take on pregnant clients? First of all, they have very low level of what to do, what not to do. So we did some research on the theoretical competences of exercise professionals, and they still believe in many myths. So what we mentioned that um, because of too high intensity, they can cause miscarriage and they are afraid of the responsibility that uh, you know the the woman will claim them uh, so this is the first reason that they are not prepared theoretically and of course later practically but um, i must say that it is a very nice tool developed again by professor Margie davenport and her team which is uh, called uh, get active questionnaire and uh, we translated it into Polish. I know that there are many translations uh, into other languages. Probably there are no, um, there's uh, no translation into Slovenian. But maybe you will be <laughs> the next partner for this team, uh, because this questionnaire, uh, in my opinion, is perfect because we are changing the approach that um, 
this is the responsibility of a woman to be physically active. She doesn't need any permission from the doctor uh, because you don't need the permission from the doctor to healthy eat, to have you know normal lifestyle, healthy lifestyle. So exercise is a part of healthy lifestyle. So you don't need any permission from your doctor to lead healthy lifestyle. And therefore, mm -hmm. um, it's a very historical approach that um, a pregnant woman um, had to have a piece of paper when it was a signature of the obstetrician and it was yeah. just a clearance to exercise. So what we do, we use the tool, the Get Active Questionnaire. So she responses uh, by herself on some questions related to her feeling, her health status, um, if she has diabetes, if she has some cardiac problem, if the pregnancy is developing in such aspects properly. So there are some uh, specific questions. And then she signs by herself, I'm aware of my health of my pregnancy and I on my own responsibility uh, starting exercise so this is something that the exercise professional should require from the client pregnant client mm -hmm. and of course if a woman um, responses yes to any of these questions so that means that she actually has some problems health problems so uh, she should be signposted to the doctor and then this is the second part of this questionnaire prepared for health professionals, for the obstetricians, for the midwives. And then such a woman should be under the supervision of, uh, you know, health professionals who should be well-trained in terms of, for example, gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension. And first of all, she requires some specific consultation. Uh, so this is a very nice tool and um, we must... Uh, also teach exercise professionals that they are not responsible for all the problems that can occur um, during pregnancy. Okay, exercise works perfectly to support better health uh, wow. of the mother, but some, uh, some complications can appear and we can not do anything about that. So of course, it is a um, situation that can happen. Usually it's like 10, 15 percent of the clients that will have some problems, but usually active pregnant women have lower risk of uh, such kind of complications. But why is it then? What what I've noticed, and I'm not the only one. When I talk to other trainers on the market, they they've noticed the same thing. So many gynecologists, obstetricians, midwives, and so on and so on. All of them are asking pretty much actively all the pregnant women not to do exercises, not to go to the fitness center, not to go to group exercise and so on and so on. Why is, why is this still such a problem with all the data available? Are they not reading that data? I Are think, they refusing it? So. Or w w where exactly is the problem? Yes, I think so that, you know, it's uh, maybe sometimes they read, but they don't believe. Uh, so mm -hmm. maybe they uh, need more time to adjust to the new knowledge, but uh, many, many doctors are changing their approach. And from my perspective, it's changing for better. So I have a wonderful team of Polish doctors that cooperates uh, with me. And we recently published new Polish guidelines on physical activity during pregnancy with a team of Polish doctors, including uh, the president of Polish Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, who spread the guidelines all over Poland. So I must say that uh, the situation is changing. So coming back to you know 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I remember that I really had the problem uh, with my participants who wanted to exercise with me and they didn't have the permission uh, from the doctor. So it was very difficult to you know, convince them that it's okay to exercise, to go maybe to another doctor to check again. Uh, but now uh, more and more doctors are supporting us. But still there is some part of them uh, who have the historical approach. And I think that this is the responsibility of those outdoors who published the stupid guidelines in 80 something, so the 1980 something, that um, uh, a woman should not 
exceed the level of 140 bits per minute of heart rate because it can yeah. be dangerous. So it was published uh, many years ago, but still some people believe in that. Um, so I think that we just need more time to, uh, to wait if the older generation <laughs> will change the approach as well. I know what maybe yes, and, you know to... i will also say something because yeah. uh, coming back to the topic of the doctors uh also a very important information to all pregnant uh, women and also exercise professionals that um, nowadays uh, putting a woman to the bed to the bed rest is unethical mm. activity so if you are told by the doctor that you should go to bed and you cannot move it is a harmful recommendation and actually you can go to the court and say <laughs> come on you wanted to harm me and my baby because what we know that this is the best the the worst recommendation ever to yeah. not to move at all so there are some complications of pregnancy and um, a woman will be um, forced not to exercise, not to go to fitness club. Of course, that's true. Yeah. But having just everyday activity, just walking, walking the dog, just moving around, uh, not to not to spend the whole day in bed because it is the first reason of the conditioning, and yeah. also some psychosocial problems related to you know, uh, feeling depressed, uh, the family problems, because the family, sometimes the younger children don't understand why the mother is not moving now, not playing with me. And, you know, the baby starts to hate the next baby who is not even born. So some uh, multi-generational problems related to this uh, recommendation. Also physiology is physiology. So we are not the uh, plants that we are not moving. We should move somehow at least uh, and we should even if the, the the pregnancy is of high risk we must move just a little bit to have short uh, boots of low intensity exercise you've done some research on your own on, on high intensity physical activity during pregnancy didn't you yes it is my best topic ever heat mama <laughs> project it's my baby and I love my project uh, and we have wonderful outcomes. Um, uh, we assess both biological, psychological and functional parameters, uh, how we can influence the mother and also the baby and the children, the infants uh, through high intensity interval training. So our participants um, attended the classes three times a week and the intensity was set uh, based on um, uh, cardiopulmonary assessment at the laboratory. So because it was a research project, we had very good equipment for that. But uh, coming back to the more practical environment, we can use the board scale. So 0 to 10, we recommended them to fill 8 or 9 in the intervals. 10 is also okay, but it is very rare that uh, they feel so you know, exhausted. So mm -hmm. nine will be perfect. So we try to exceed the anaerobic threshold and we would like to improve both aerobic and anaerobic intensity mm -hmm. uh, capacity uh, of, of the body. And it's really, it's really good exercise for them. So we observed um, better outcomes related to depression, to cardiopulmonary parameters, to VO2 max, heart rate max, uh, and um, a very nice uh, uh, biomarker, which is placenta uh, PLGF. Uh, so this is a marker related to the placenta development. Mm -hmm. And we observed that using HIT, we, uh, we had better levels of this biomarker. So that wow. means that, yes, so we actually can support the development of the placenta. But these data are just pilot data. And of course, we cannot generalize it yet but we would like to repeat this project and to analyze it so uh, we have a very nice team again it was um, with the cooperation of the polish doctors professor uh, sebastian kwiatkowski who is gynecologist and it was his idea to uh, to analyze this biomarker so uh, it's not that only exercise uh, you know <laughs> scientists 
uh, are interested in this topic, but also doctors uh, would like to support the patients. I'm, I'm glad to hear. Next time you, you'll be hosting one of the one of the educational seminars and courses over here, I will definitely invite, directly invite gynecologists and all of the others uh, that are involved in that process, you know, to raise awareness of that and to provide them maybe a bit more up-to-date scientific research and data on that so they can, you know, readjust the recommendations and so on. So that's definitely the case. Okay, I have a I have a small list of certain things that I've um, observed on the market in the past few years, and I like you to help me to bust those myths. Uh, so one influencer was was claiming the following: ninety eight percent of all females that were pregnant after six months, so six months after birth, they still have a diastasis recti. True or false? Uh, uh, once again, Nin so the question is 98 percent. 98. Actually, I don't know if so many. Probably, it is probable that they have some bigger separation of, uh, you know, abdominis muscle. But the problem is that we cannot clearly define what is pathology, what is physiology. So this is typical situation that the linea alba is stretched a lot during pregnancy, and. Uh, a few decades before, we used the distance of two finger breath, uh, yes. like, you know, it was maybe three, around four centimeters, and everything above that level was considered as pathology. Nowadays, we can say that even um, more fingers <laughs> is okay if the abdominals uh, are working properly and the function is not disturbed we cannot observe any pain and hernia hernia is very very dangerous so even if we have one finger separation and it's pain and we observe hernia so it should be treated um, by the doctor but um first of all we should not be afraid of the longer distance between abdominis muscles we must work out them properly we have a lot of exercises that actually can contribute we believe they can contribute to uh, to the treatment and the prevention of diastasis recti abdominis but again we have no data no clear data that this specific exercise will work for all women and it is the only one that we should do and it is something that is sold perfectly that there are some physiotherapists and trainers that they sell exercises that perfectly work for all women it's not true what i can say very important is the technique of working out um, abdominal muscles so we should properly breathe we should contract the muscles um, together with um, uh, exhalation and we should have proper posture, not to have, uh, not to increase the chances to separate both sides of erectus yeah. dominis. Yeah. Uh, so again, during our seminars, we have many uh, uh, examples of exercises, and I try to teach exercise professionals how to assess the proper technique. And actually, the list of exercises that we can do is very long, and the adjustment of the exercises is quite easy. Uh, so there is no exercise that I can say it's forbidden. You should not do that because you can decrease the risk of um, diastasis recti abdominis. So it's not, not, not true. Okay. So okay. actually, I don't know the, the percentage. So so sometimes, uh, at, from my perspective, all women at the end of pregnancy have the higher separation that they had before because it's natural. But yeah. um, six months after birth, probably it will be still higher than it was before pregnancy. But many of them probably will have quite normal condition of the abdominis muscle. I will ask my assistant here to look it up. Um, so if you can search for it, I believe there was around 2018, 19, there was um, a scientist in Finland doing a huge research with over 3000 participants, trying to find out how many percentage wise had actually, you know, something that could be classified as diastasis recti, um, six weeks after birth, 18 weeks. And and 26 weeks i believe so if you can look that up um for me and maybe we can get back to them 
if I recall that correctly, I believe that it was somewhere around 66% right. Uh, so after six weeks after birth, and it fell down below 50 after three months and below 33 after six months. And if I'm not mistaken, in that study, she had to exclude those that were regularly exercising prior to getting pregnant because that was not evident. So there was way, way, way less than that. So if, if nothing else, if, if you cannot find it right now, then I will find it later on and put it up there on the screen so you guys can can find it on your own. Maybe I've, I've just, you know, did not point to the accurate numbers. So I'm, apologies for that. I will look it up again and I will uh, put the link to the study as well into, into the description uh, here under that podcast. Okay, so you already said that, but still, if you do crunches, this is the one, the single one exercise that you shouldn't be doing. That you shouldn't be doing or should be that doing? That you should not be doing. That That's the influencer <laughs> saying. Okay. No, we like crunches and we have a nice study from the um, international team from Portugal and Norway, and maybe Spain. I don't remember. So it was the first author was Patricia Motta from Portugal. And, mm -hmm. um, and they assessed that uh, during crunches, uh, the both parts of rectus abdominis is in better position immediately after the crunch. And nowadays we recommend doing crunches uh, as a preventive exercise and also in uh, the therapy of exercise. So it was um, uh, confirmed by the team um, uh, also led by Professor Karibu. So they checked how the linea alba is changing the, the, the distance between um, both sides of abdominis muscles. Mm -hmm. And uh, in crunches, again, the distance was, was much lower. So it was confirmation that crunches and crunches with twists um, uh, are should be recommended. And the exercise, which is commonly recommended, like drawing in exercise, so it's only the activation of the transversus muscle. So it actually made the distance uh, bigger. So <laughs> and actually it was against everything that we were taught before. And nice. um, Yes, so so uh, I recommend doing crunches. I believe they work, but still I must say it clearly. We don't have um, good evidence to say that it will always work. So it's it's to be checked for every uh, every single individual how the muscles are behaving during each exercise. If it's not painful, if we have good progress. But generally, uh, in the, the whole group, I usually recommend doing that. Okay. Then the next claim was don't do planks in the first trimester. In the first trimester. Okay. So <laughs> this is, I don't understand why the claim is like that. So planks are uh, good exercises. There are many people who love planks. There are some people who don't like planks because they are technically difficult to be performed. So it's always what you like to do, but for sure it's not dangerous. And what I even do, I recommend continuing doing plants, uh, even if the pregnancy is progressing. So even during the second trimester or third trimester, I have some participants that uh, are still doing plants, uh, even if the pregnancy is very advanced. We must be aware that if the technique is not correct, we can decrease the severity of back pain. Uh, so a woman should be well trained to keep the proper technique by the end of pregnancy. But if she's able to do that, it's a good exercise for her as any other exercises which are on the list not to be done. I see. I see. So are they, then uh, cycling is not good for you because the weight is pushing down, you know, when you when you are at the seat. How's about oh, that? Cycling is not. Oh, so, so this is stupid, actually, <laughs> because cycling okay. is good for the back. And uh, I recommend cycling for these women who cannot jog because of the back pain or because of the pelvic muscle problems. 
So if the urinary incontinence is very severe, so cycling would be good for them because they sit. So they have good support from you know, outside the body and the, uh, we don't have the high impact that can treat the pelvic muscle problems. So for sure, I would recommend cycling for many reasons. As I mentioned before, that you are um, you know, enjoying the environment, natural environment, and it's active transportation. You can do it with the family together, with the friends. So uh, yeah, so it's stupid. It's stupid and harmful. As I said, some myths are harmful and um, we should <laughs> put such influencers into jail, spreading such information. I've, I found a study in, in the meanwhile, by the way. So let me go back to that. Probably it was, uh, I hope I pronounced the name right, Jorun Bakken-Sperstad. And it was published in June 2016. So what they found out is the following. So the prevalence of the diastasis recti was 33.1%. That is in at the gestation week 21. And then they measure it six, six weeks, six months, and 12 months postpartum. So that, and then, so six weeks, six months, and 12 months postpartum, the results were the following. 60% had still, you know, according to the two, uh, to the two finger measures, 60% uh, were still having it six weeks postpartum. Only 45.4% had it still six months postpartum, postpartum, and it went down to 30, 32.6% 12 months after birth. So it's not it's it's not even close to 98% what the influencers claim, right? Yes, yes. And as I said, so um, it is, um, again, uh, important what classification we use. So even... This 12 month postpartum, uh, so maybe these bellies were quite okay. So we are worried when you can see a hole in the belly. So yes, this is something that we should treat seriously, both especially for you know some aesthetical reasons, um, but also you no know, because we need the abdominal wall <laughs> at the front of the body. Uh, so it's important, but sometimes the separation uh, is not disturbing too much. So it's slowly getting lower and lower and using better technique probably we can support the mother how to treat it and it will disappear um i said probably because it's not so clear and i must underline again that there is no gold standard for the treatment of diastasis recti many physiotherapists sell for huge money you know gold methods that for sure it will work but again we must individually assess and adjust the treatment methods to um, the situation to the condition of the mother and and some methods will work for one body other will not but exercises generally are uh, useful to prevent uh, and we observe the lower rate of diastasis recti in active women Okay, then the next claim would be the following. You should not start exercising for the first three months after giving birth. After giving birth. Um, yeah. So our recommendations, and it's not only our Polish, but it's from American College of Sports, uh, no, Sports Medicine, uh, American, ICOC, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Yeah. So uh, the recommendation, again, is clear as soon as medically safe. So if the mother leaves the hospital, if she feels okay, uh, if she was checked in terms of pelvic floor muscles, you know, the, the, the uh, female organs, uh, and if any, any injuries are not disturbing exercise, uh, she can start slowly, slowly, because it's not that... Um, the pregnancy didn't cause anything and that the birth didn't cause anything. So mm -hmm. usually it is a very demanding um, uh, situation in women's life. So they must have time to rest, to recover, but some exercises, simple exercises to increase the circulation should be performed even one day, two days after giving birth pelvic muscles as soon as possible immediately uh, if a woman feels 
comfortable with that. So even on the same day of giving birth, just to check if it was not damaged during uh, natural birth. So no, waiting for three months is harmful. It's harmful for both the mother and the baby because we would like them not only to have healthy body, but also um, to feel uh, you know, nice, a nice woman, uh, uh, an efficient mother in doing everyday stuff. Here's the last one for today. Uh, I mean, the myth. So no woman should lift more than three kilos. Um, once again, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I don't believe what you read. <laughs> that was that was actually the trainer of Gwyneth Paltrow, Tracy Anderson, claiming that that was in the mid 2010, so around 2014, 15, that she said that. So no woman should lift more than three kilograms, and that's why she trained Gwyneth Paltrow with no more than three kilograms. But I just, you know, I just want to provoke that laugh as well, because it's so, it's so, pardon my language, it's so freaking stupid, because that would mean that you're not allowed to carry your baby around. But on the other hand, you then hire a nanny to do that for you. But she's a female as well. So how does that add up? Um, yes. You know, it's, it's just, it's just funny, the claims that we've here. Yes, yes, that, that's it, true. And uh, again, so it's not logical. So if you have a baby, uh, no. So sometimes the baby has around three and a half kilo when the baby is born, or it can be around four kilograms. And after a few weeks, it's <laughs> five, six, eight kilograms, right? So as you said, okay. so about carrying the baby and it's not the baby only, but having different stuff uh, in your hands, Bags. always, you know, going to do shopping or just oh, yeah. to go for a walk and carrying everything together with you. So you have a lot of stuff on you. Uh, yeah, so it, it's it's ridiculous. Okay, so <laughs> doing everyday activities, you are carrying right around 15 kilograms uh, and you cannot exercise with the barbells like three. <laughs> it's yep. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 ridiculous. I know, I know. Okay, there's one more thing that I would like to to ask you for today, and especially how, in your opinion or in your experience, how does training affect breastfeeding? So we have uh, only a few data on that. That it, first of all, that the quality and quantity of um, milk is not changed when a mother exercises even intensively. But we for sure require more data on that topic. So um, we would like to say that um, it supports the lactation, but it's no data on that so far. Um, good evidence um, and, and good quality data uh, but generally when we think about how the body works um, so lactation is a very demanding process for the body so if the mother is stronger the body works better and more effectively through exercise because we improve the circulation and all the organs that uh, should support all the processes so it is logically that um, Okay, so we, we have tremendous claims. You were just cut off in between, Anna, so welcome back. Um, so what would be your recommendation, the final one, for trainers and pregnant females and young mothers, of course, alike? So what, what would you, be your words of wisdom to them? Uh, so can you say <laughs> the question once again so what i would recommend sure, sure. them or so, yeah what what would be your words of wisdom so what would you what would your message be for trainers pregnant women and young mothers okay. how to how to take on exercise and a healthy lifestyle um so first of all so this is a very physiological part of yeah. the <laughs> of the podcast yeah, so um, we need to move. So this is always what I uh, repeat. So the body must move. So during pregnancy and during postpartum, we must move. So if you are a mother, so you are moving not only for yourself, 
but also for the baby. So starting from the very early uh, stage of pregnancy, um, you should exercise. And it's not only responsibility for you, but for the future generations. So sometimes we must also remember that working out, uh, we support the whole planet. So maybe it sounds strange, mm -hmm. but if we have healthier body, the future generation will be healthier and we have healthier citizens of our planet and we are more creative, we work better, we spend less money on health service, so we must remember about that. And also it's important to underline that uh, even the third generation benefits from the maternal exercise. So now we have some studies that prove that the uh, grandmother, grandmother exercise influence the health of the baby. <laughs> so it's not only for you, for your baby, but for your grandchildren as well. So uh, this is my message. Uh, and for the exercise professionals, um, they should not be worried. Uh, they do a great work. They do something uh, very important, not only because they like uh, working out with the client, but they also support uh, the future generation um, in terms of health and uh, proper development. Thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time away of your work to talk to me today. I really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to see you very soon on the educational seminars and courses that we're doing with you. So if you're interested in any kind of work with Anna, Find everything below in the description. You will have all the links and everything that I want to share with you down below. Follow Anna around. Follow her on, on Facebook. Um, you have an Instagram account as well so that, that we can follow. Or are you not sharing too, much, too many things on Instagram? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> what I'm sharing? I, I mean, share everything. I yeah. have research for, gate. For the my... followers. For the <laughs> followers. You know, so what, what they should follow. If they want to follow you around, Instagram, Facebook, anything else? Yes, I am on Facebook. Uh, so I must say that uh, I'm not the influencer, okay? Uh, I don't have time on that. I'm sorry. So you are my <laughs> um, <laughs> my supporter in the term. So I publish a lot. I have our uh, Facebook is Facebook, but we have ResearchGate when, where you can find all the publications. So it's some kind of Facebook for scientists, okay? Well, we are sharing their comments and you know concerns about projects and uh, scientific um, uh, achievements so you can find all my papers there and we have the uh, NEPE project website so uh, the new era of pregnancy and postpartum uh, exercise and you can find there uh, the products of our um, collaboration international collaboration so it's nice to have a look there because some resources are completely for free. We have uh, many uh, booklets, guidelines, uh, and these are evidence-based guidelines. But most of us don't have time to, <laughs> to, uh, to promote it uh, as many influencers do. So maybe it's time to promote like that. True, true. Thanks, Anna, <laughs> again. Um, I'm looking forward to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I hope to see many people uh, on our seminar. Okay. Um, and that I will have chance to meet you uh, in real life and teach you how to work with pregnant and postpartum clients.